Back in 1884, over Montana Way, there was this cattleman by the name of Granville Stewart who organized himself a vigilante committee that came to be known as Stewart Stranglers. And this was in response to the same stuff we've been discussing in this series. Montana had its own version of the WSGA, the Montana Stock Growers Association, and they too had their hands full with rustlers and thieves. Fed up with all the nonsense, Granville and his stranglers went on a murder spree, killing anywhere from 20 to 100 rustlers, or alleged rustlers. It's not like Stewart's stranglers were exactly all that concerned with proper judicial proceedings. Now, to learn more about this particular incident, I'd recommend the series on Granville that my friends did over at How the West Was Fucked. Link in the show notes. I think you'll really enjoy it. Spoiler alert. Not only were Stewart's stranglers never held responsible for these lynchings, but Granville himself would go on to live a very long life, becoming an accomplished author and politician, never doing so much as one day in jail. And it was his success and lack of accountability that would be the model that the WSGA looked to for inspiration when it came to their own troubles down there in Johnson County. By the way, this is part three of the Frank Can series. If you have not listened to the previous two installments, you might want to do so. Those links are also down in the show notes. If all you're wanting to do is hear tell about the Johnson County War, well, you're partially in luck. We've already discussed the build-up to it, the deaths of Jim Averell and Ella Watson, the revenge killings that followed, including a couple of murders that our very own Frank Canton possibly committed. And we left off with Frank returning to Johnson County with a bit of violence on the mind. And make no mistake about it, Jack, things is about to get real violent. My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. Although Frank Canton and the WSGA had themselves a murder list, I don't believe there was any serious consideration in killing everybody on it. The idea was that if they struck hard and fast into Johnson County and took out some of their most blatant opposition, the rest would simply scatter and leave the territory, or at very least start acting right. Now, we don't know how many people for certain were on the list, but there were 34 names reported in an issue of the Chicago Herald, likely given to them by the WSGA. That included the previously mentioned Jack Flagg and Nate Champion, along with the brother of the murdered Orly Ranger Jones. These were supposed to be some of the worst of the worst when it came to the rustlers. Now, later in life, Canton would lie his ass off saying that he and his men secured arrest warrants for 10 to 12 of these so-called rustlers. This was not the case. The entire invasion we're about to discuss was true vigilanteism, if that's even a word, done completely outside of the bounds of law. And it was done with the full support and blessing of Wyoming's most elite. Guys like then-Governor Amos Barber, U.S. Senators Warren and Kerry, even the bosses at the Union Pacific. Everybody who was anybody, meaning holding any type of influence or power, was squarely on the side of Frank Canton and these invaders. Now, I know I'm painting both the WSGA and Canton in a pretty negative light, so let me make myself clear. I have no doubt there was plenty of legitimate rustling going on in Johnson County. And once the jury stopped convicting people, I'm sure a lot of this theft became flagrant. A big fuck you to the cattle barons. Were the large ranching operations provoked? Yes. Was there a problem with cattle and horse theft? Sure. But did this warrant taking the law into their own hands and attempting to kill dozens of men without any sort of a trial or due process? In my opinion, absolutely fucking not. But as always, please let me know what you think. Josh at WildWestExtra.com Now, if you'll remember, Frank Cannon had just spent the entire winter in Chicago while his lawyers tried to get rid of that pesky little murder charge hanging over his head. And as he made his way back to Wyoming, one of his buddies was headed down south. Another former WSGA detective, guy named Tom Smith, was sent on down to Texas on a recruiting mission. His goal? Hire a small army of mercenary gunslingers. I guess that even in those days, the idea was that Texas was still a breeding ground for killers. Remember, this was the 1890s. Dodge City had been tamed for a long time. Tombstone was tamed. Deadwood, Lincoln County. Hell, for all intents and purposes, the era known as the Wild West was mostly over. Texas, however, particularly in places like El Paso, was still plenty rough around the edges. Interestingly enough, Tom Smith did not have to head all the way to El Paso or even Fort Worth. He did all of his recruiting in Paris, Texas, a little town less than 20 miles south of Indian Territory. 
There was a federal courthouse there that had jurisdiction over the Chickasaw Nation, sort of a smaller scale Texas version of Fort Smith, Arkansas. And the men that Tom Smith recruited were unemployed federal officers, just hanging around hoping to catch a warrant they could serve up north across the Red River. And it was a bit of a motley crew. You had some inexperienced guys, even some very young guys, like the 20-year-old Buck Garrett and his brother J.A. And you had some very dangerous and proven men, guys like Jeff Minette, David Booker, and George Tucker. Now, for what it's worth, these Texas officers were told that their services were needed up in Wyoming to help put an end to a rustling epidemic. Whether or not any of them would have backed out had they known the truth, I don't know. I'm also not sure if any of them balked at the killing once they ran Johnson County and figuring out what was what. Finally, on April 5th, 1892, this small army assembled in Cheyenne, Wyoming. If I'm not mistaken, all total, there were 52 invaders. The 20 or so hired gunmen from Texas, Frank Cannon, of course, some of his old WSGA detective buddies, and about 19 or 20 of the big ranch owners and managers. And the kind of, sort of leader of this whole brigade was none other than Frank Walcott, the former Union Army officer I mentioned back on the first episode in the series. And I say kind of, sort of, because, long story short, he and Frank Cannon started button heads. Both of them wanted to be in charge. Wolcott would end up making a big speech, resigning his position of leadership for the good of the cause, but once in the field, he would still be calling a lot of the shots. Now, speaking of calling shots, here's a fun little side note for all you gun enthusiasts out there. Thanks to author Bill O'Neill, we have a pretty good idea of the type of armament the invaders were packing. The WSGA passed out a bunch of brand new 4490 Sharps rifles, as well as a few 3855 Winchesters both of which were more powerful than the 44 caliber carbines that most of them Texas boys had. That said, a few of them did opt to keep their 4440s. Various other long guns recorded among the invaders included a 4570, a 4060, a 4082, a plain old-fashioned shotgun, and even a 44 martini. As far as sidearms go, uh, Colt 45s won the day. Nevertheless, there were a few Colt 44s in the mix, as well as a Colt 38, a 55 Webley, along with a 42 caliber revolver. Thus armed, the invaders all loaded up in a private six-car train right there in Cheyenne that would haul them all the way to Casper, where they would unload and continue via horseback. To prepare the way, others were busy cutting telegraph lines in and out of Buffalo, isolating the home with the so-called rustlers. And it was Buffalo that was the real target. The original plan was to strike the town hard and fast, to ride in and take the rustlers by surprise, scorched earth style. However, when the vigilantes were on their way, they got word there was a whole bunch of rustlers holed up at the KC Ranch. This caused even more arguments. Canton and his buddy Hess wanted to stay the course and keep advancing on Buffalo. But the others, like Walcott and WSGA member Billy Irvine, wanted to clean out the wolf den at the KC. In the end, those in favor of attacking the KC won the day, and likely doomed the entire operation. On the morning of April 9th, the invaders surrounded the ranch only to find that just two of their targets were holed up there, Nate Champion and another cowboy named Nick Ray. There were actually four men in total, but the other two were just trappers who happened to be in the area. One of them came out of the small cabin with a bucket, hoping to fetch some water, and was apprehended as soon as he hit the tree line. Next up was the other trapper. He too left the cabin and was nabbed by Frank Canton and the others. Luckily for both of these guys, they were able to convince the vigilantes that they were just innocent fur trappers, and as such, they were left unharmed. The same could not be said for Champion and Nick Ray. When Nick finally emerged from the cabin, still unaware of the danger outside, one of the Texas gunmen drilled him through and through. Ray, still on his feet, tries to make it back into the cabin, but collapses just inside of the door as the invaders all open up fire. At the same time, Nate Champion runs over, bullets snapping all around him, and pulls Ray back inside, slamming the door shut. The fight was on, and for the next hour or so, round after round would be pumped into the tiny cabin, with Nate firing back sporadically just to keep the attackers at bay and let them know he was still alive. And during some of the lulls in the fighting, Nate began scrawling out a record of the events in a little notebook. I think he saw right off that he wasn't going to make it as outnumbered as he was, and I guess he wanted to leave a record of what really happened. It is now about two hours since the first shot. Nick is still alive. They are still shooting and are all around the house. Boys, there is bullets coming in like hell. Continuing even later, Champion would write, Nick is dead. He died about 9 o'clock. I see smoke down at the stable and I think they have fired it. I don't think they intend to let me get away this time. Boys, I feel pretty lonesome just about now. 
I wish there was someone here with me so we could watch all sides at once. Much to Champion's surprise, the gunfire from the invaders is soon diverted from him to a wagon rushing by in the distance. Nate had no idea who this was, but the WSGA gunman immediately recognized the interloper as Jack Flagg, the so-called King of the Rustlers. He rode through not knowing what was going on, and considering him an easy target, the invaders opened up fire. Luckily for Flagg, he was able to get away, and much to the chagrin of the vigilantes, he became a Johnson County Paul Revere, spreading news as quickly as he could that they were under invasion. Still, the attackers continued to lay siege to the cabin, once again against Frank Canton's advisement. He urged breaking off the attack and moving on to Buffalo, but was once again overruled by Walcott and them others who wanted to finish the job at hand. And finish it, they did. I guess Flagg, in his haste to get away, had abandoned his wagon, and the invaders seized it, filling it full of straw and wood and shoving it against Champion's cabin turned fortress and setting it on fire. The house is all fired. Nate wrote, Goodbye, boys, if I never see you again. Moments later, the bravest man in Johnson County, as one paper would call Nate Champion, bolted from the cabin, Winchester in hand. Racing through the smoke with bullets whizzing past him, Nate pumped his legs and somehow, miraculously, made his way across a meadow and towards a gulch without getting hit. Unfortunately, there were some of the hired guns from Texas stationed at the gulch in question. Champion ran straight into him and was able to squeeze off just one shot before he was riddled with bullets. In Frank Canton's own words, quote, Champion was determined not to surrender. He came out fighting and died game, end quote. Now Nate, from his vantage point in the cabin, was not able to inflict a whole hell of a lot of damage. They just weren't giving the man any easy shots and hell, it was 50 to 1. That said, he was able to shoot a couple of the Texans, though, one through the arm and the other through the leg. As far as I know, they were the only invaders injured during this fight. As for the guy that likely fired the fatal shot that killed Champion, it's widely thought to have been Jeff Minette. If you've ever seen the photo of all the Johnson County invaders, he's the one that's seated on the left with the newspaper. I couldn't find out much on the man, but he was a former Texas Ranger, Sheriff, and Deputy U.S. Marshal with a bit of a temper. He was once insulted in the pages of a Gainesville, Texas newspaper, and he went in search of the offending reporter. Once located, Minette knocked the journalist out with one blow and then proceeded to kick the man's teeth out. Now there is another man who was rumored to have fired that fatal shot that took Nate Champion down, and we will reveal his name in just a moment. Don't you worry. For now, though, the invaders would have to push on, having killed a good man and wasted an entire day doing so, but not before scribbling a note of their own one that read Cattle Thieves Beware and pinning it to Nate's body, leaving him unburied. That evening, the vigilantes would suffer their first death, a big old boy named Texan Jim Dudley. I guess his horse bucked him, causing his rifle to fall to the ground where it discharged, the bullet shattering his leg. By the time Dudley was able to receive proper medical attention, the wound had turned gangrenous. They had to amputate, and he went into shock during the procedure, and that was it for Texan Jim. Poor guy. I mean, hell, he won't even be able to hear this quick word from this episode's sponsor. But hey, you can. All right, welcome back. Going forward with the next series, I will be posting them all on Patreon, not only ad-free, but at the same time. So along with added benefit of no pesky commercials, you'll also be able to binge the entire series in one sitting. All right, back to Frank Cannon and the Johnson County War. The next morning, following the tragic death of Tex and Jim, it was time for the invaders to finally attack the town of Buffalo. But the citizens were more than ready. One of the WSGA spies in town met the invaders as they approached and urged them to turn back, saying that everybody in town was gunning for them and that if they valued their lives, they'd get to cover. Oh boy. Not what this mercenary army envisioned the day prior. Now it was they who started to get nervous. Not Canton, though. He still wanted to attack. That was his main goal this whole time, to just attack the shit out of Buffalo. It's crazy when you think about it. You know, calling these guys simply a lynch mob or vigilantes is a little bit of an understatement. 50 plus men heavily armed and with the full backing of every politician in the territory. Men whose ranks included some of the richest people in Wyoming, along with a bunch of hired killers they brought in via train from out of state. They literally invade an entire county with a kill list and then cut all the telegraph wires into the town that they want to sack. And Frank Canton currently lived nearby. That's the crazy part. He had actually lived in the town of Buffalo for several years. 
For the entire time he was sheriff, Canton walked the streets of Buffalo every day, brushing shoulders with the townsfolk, probably tipping his hat to the ladies, watching the little children play. He did business in the stores, got his hair cut, used the livery stables. These were his neighbors, and here he was ready to lay waste to the entire town, or at very least put all those civilians in danger, people with whom he was once tasked with protecting. He was ready and willing to put them and their family in harm's way by turning Buffalo into a war zone. Why? Was he really that angry over some rich people's horses getting stolen or just some unbranded cattle? Was it a power play and he was just bitter at not being able to get the convictions with Johnson County juries? Was he mad that they didn't want him for sheriff again? There are some that theorize Canton was in such a tizzy to attack Buffalo with the hopes of getting rid of any evidence that could link him to the murders of Ranger Jones and John Tisdale. On the other hand, Canton defenders think he simply wanted to see to his property. Like I said, his ranch was just a few miles away, and he hadn't been there in quite some time. And believe it or not, this theory actually does hold water, as Frank's home would indeed be vandalized over the next few days. Nonetheless, the invaders would not attack Buffalo. Calmer heads prevailed, and the vigilantes fell back to the T.A. ranch, where they had spent the previous night. And my, how the turntables do turn. The invaders now became the defenders. This is where Major Walcott really shined. He started ordering folks around, and in no time flat, the ranch was a mini fortress. Trenches were dug, breastworks erected. Hell, they even augured holes in the walls of the cabin and barn so they could shoot out of them. Good thing they did, too, because they were going to need a damn fortress to withstand what was coming. A whole lot of pissed-off Johnson County locals, nearly 200 of them, all armed to the teeth and toting a cannon. Yes, a cannon. Okay, so they didn't really have a cannon, but they almost did. Uh, Johnson County Sheriff Red Angus did indeed go to nearby Fort McKinney and try to requisition a cannon, but the army said, nah, no sir, we're just going to sit this one out. So it became a long-range sniping sort of thing. The invaders were well dug in and fortified thanks to Major Walcott and the army of so-called rustlers, and they simply started trading sporadic rifle fire throughout the day and the days that followed. Per excavations done on site years later, the numerous shell casings were found with plenty of empty whiskey bottles, so I'm assuming them boys were well hydrated during the fight as well. Now, the invaders did send out a couple of messengers on the sly hoping to get help. Finally, influential rancher and WSGA bigwig Morton Freewin got word of what was going on and began pulling strings. He got to hold to the governor, and the governor got to hold to the senators, and they all went to the damn president of the United States of America himself. Benjamin Harrison. I always forget that guy was president, by the way. Uh, died of the flu, Benjamin Harrison. Just four years after leaving office. Anyway, long story short, the commanding officer of Fort McKinney would have to get involved, whether he wanted to or not, as he soon received orders to get over to the TA and put an end to the nonsense. Just in the nick of time, too. The Johnson County rustlers, and I am using that term in quotations, more accurately, I should say the pissed off residents of Johnson County that didn't appreciate a bunch of mercenaries invading their territory were about to rub the invaders out. And not in a good way. They had dynamite at this point, and they had constructed a quote unquote go devil, a little contraption that they dubbed the Ark of Safety. Two wagons lashed together and reinforced with eight inch logs and bells of hay stacked six feet high on the top. This could conceal and provide cover for up to possibly as many as 40 men as they advanced on the ranch with the aforementioned dynamite. And just as they were about to light it, here comes the dadgum cavalry, blowing bugles and ordering a ceasefire and finally conferring with Sheriff Red Angus and his field commander, feller known as Arapaho Brown. The big question soon became what the hell to do with all these invaders, who at this point were more than willing to surrender. The army couldn't just hand them over to the citizens of Johnson County, not in good conscience. I mean, hell, they'd have strung them all up at that very moment. Finally, it was agreed upon that the vigilantes would surrender to military authority and come under their protection. Uh, I referenced that photo earlier of the Johnson County invaders. Feel free to Google it or subscribe to my 100% free newsletter. Pretty interesting photo. Uh, they're all pictured in it, all 50 some odd men. All the hired guns, Frank Canton, Walcott, they're all there, looking pretty damn smug considering that they nearly just got themselves killed. Now, I'm not sure, but I think that photo was taken at Fort McKinney, where the military initially took the invaders following their rescue. And there was a fear of the rustlers attacking the fort. 
Old Sheriff Angus actually showed up after discovering what had happened in a champion. So the vigilantes ended up getting transferred to Fetterman and then to Fort Russell, which was closer to Cheyenne. While this was the defining moment of the Johnson County War, it was not the end of hostilities. The Northern Wyoming Farmers and Stock Growers Association, remember them? Well, they planned an early roundup in defiance of the WSGA. In hopes of countering this, the cattle barons had some U.S. deputies sent in. One of them, by the name of George Wellman, was shot and killed from ambush, just about a month after the big fight at the T.A. Ranch. And I mentioned a moment ago that there were fears Fort McKinney would be attacked when the invaders were taken there. Well, even after the vigilantes were transferred, there was still lingering animosity towards the military outpost. Many of the citizens of Johnson County resented the Army's involvement with what they considered a civilian matter, and someone even set the damn fort on fire, resulting in a few buildings being burned down and a few exploded powder kegs. And then finally, in May of 1893, Nate Champion's brother Dudley was shot and killed by WSGA detective Mike Shaughnessy. Mike would claim that Dudley came gunning for him and drew first and that he killed the man in self-defense. Others say that Shaughnessy killed Champion in cold blood, getting the drop on him and doing him in before the brother could exact revenge. Who knows? Uh, Dudley would be the last death in the Johnson County War, though. And interestingly enough, his killer, Mike Shaughnessy, would be the last living participant in the war, not dying until 1954. As for the WSGA, they're still around today. And to their credit, in the years that followed the Johnson County War, they're no longer murdering people. That's always nice. And they've also become a little bit more inclusive, opening up the books for the smaller ranchers. As for Ken, his time in Wyoming was coming to an end. I mean, he couldn't exactly just go back to Buffalo as if nothing happened, right? Might make buying groceries just a tad bit awkward. Now, Frank would accidentally shoot himself while in Cheyenne. Uh, he and the other invaders were put up in a large auditorium, but they were free to come and go as they pleased. One morning at around 3.30, after what I assume was a long night of drinking, Canton was showing off his pistol when he dropped it and it went off, the bullet striking him just a few inches above the ankle. When he actually had to go to court, he had to be carried in on a stretcher and propped up on pillows. Now, neither he nor any of the other invaders would face prosecution for what they did. They'd be brought up on charges, but there were zero convictions. I guess money talks, right? Frank still had the issue of John Tisdale's murder hanging over his head, but that was squashed as well. The main witness against him, Charlie Bosch, that old boy who saw Frank on the side of the road with a pistol in his hand, well, he disappeared. What it all boiled down to was the state not having enough evidence to take Canton to trial. It was Bosch's word against many a prominent citizen who vouched for Frank's whereabouts. And like I said, Bosch disappeared, so he wasn't going to be taking the stand either. Now, as sinister as that sounds, Bosch was not made to disappear, a la mafia style. He left Johnson County still very much alive and would stay that way for quite some time. Matter of fact, he'd speak out again as late as 1935 and claim for the very first time ever that there was another man with Frank Canton that fateful day on the road when Tisdale was murdered. And that mystery man was none other than notorious killer Tom Horn. Now, I did cover Tom Horn a long time ago, back when this here monstrosity was known as a Bloody Beaver podcast. But just a real quick, and I do mean quick, recap. Tom was born in Missouri in 1860, so he's about a decade younger than Frank Canton. Escaping from a bit of a traumatic childhood, Horn headed out west while still a teenager and got a job with the U.S. Army. First as a packer, and then as a scout and interpreter for Chief of Scouts Al Sieber. Spending the next few years working for Sieber, Tom Horn would participate in various campaigns against the Apache. Was there at Geronimo's surrender in 1886, and he gained a bit of a reputation after killing a man in a duel over a prostitute. Killing never seemed to be hard for Tom Horn. Matter of fact, later in life, he'd brag about it, saying that killing men was his specialty. They looked at it like a business proposition, and that he had the corner on the market. After the Apache issue was settled, Horn kind of wandered, did a little bit of cow punching and prospecting, even wore a badge for a bit before taking on some jobs for the large cattle outfits. Horn took part in Arizona's Pleasant Valley War before finally being hired by the Pinkerton Detective Agency in 1890, working out of their Denver office. As such, when the Johnson County War kicked off, the agency sent Horn in under the assumed name of Tom Hell. And it was in this undercover role that Horn went to work for the WSGA. He was most likely in Johnson County when Tisdale and Jones were murdered. And the killing from ambush is more of his M.O. than that of Frank Canton's. 
And it's not just Bosch who said that Tom Horn was the one who killed these two men. Another former Pinkerton and future topic here at the Wild West Extravaganza, Charlie Seringo, also claimed it was Horn. And he said he got this information from old man Pinkerton himself, and it's the reason that Tom was eventually fired from the detective agency. For what it's worth, there's no way of proving any of this. You know, Bosch's testimony changed with each telling. He didn't mention Tom Horn until four decades after the fact, and let's face it, Charlie Seringo ain't the best of sources. Some people claim that it was Tom Horn who was sent to Texas to hire the mercenaries, and we know this is not true. Others say that he accompanied the invaders as they made their charge into Johnson County, and that it was even him who fired that shot that killed Nate Champion. Not sure if there's any proof of any of this other than circumstantial and anecdotal stories. He certainly wasn't among the 52 men arrested and brought into Cheyenne. But if Tom didn't do it, that would once again make Frank Canton the prime suspect. So who the hell knows, man? These murders will likely remain unsolved forever. What do you think? Who killed Ranger Jones and John Tisdell? Was it Frank Canton or Tom Horn or somebody else? Is Frank Canton the bad guy here? What about the Johnson County invaders? Were they in the right? Should they have sacked the town of Buffalo? Was Frank Canton a vampire? Josh at WildWestExtra.com. Email me. I would love to hear your thoughts. Finally, I would like to sum up this war in the words of two of the participants. First off, one of the invaders, former U.S. Marshal and hired Texas gunman George Tucker. I think his surprisingly honest and introspective words could lend a bit of texture to the mentality of the time. Tucker, in his old age, wrote, quote, I have hunted men, killed men, good men, bad men, innocent men, and men who could instruct the devil in the ways of crime. I have killed men who had forfeited the right to live and other men who were not bad at all. I may have shot too fast on certain occasions, but those who were a second too slow are not left to tell the tales of their adventures. It was, in those days, a dangerous calling. Life was much cheaper, and blood was spilled with abandon. It wasn't so bad to kill a man then. End quote. And then finally, we've got the less dramatic words of Johnson County resident Bear George McClennan, a guy who at one point had actually worked with Frank Canton. Mr. Bear said, quote, my judgment is that it was like most other human questions. There was cause on both sides. It is true that the cowmen could not secure conviction in the courts, and their provocation was great. There is no doubt. But how that could lead to a set of sane, rational men to think that they could just blacklist a lot of men in a community and then proceed to go out and exterminate them is more than I could ever figure out. Also, nobody wants to talk about the vampires. End quote. And of course, that's not true. I added that last part. The rest was a very real quote all the way up to him saying that he could never figure it out. And I tend to agree with what he had to say. Like I've already mentioned, uh, I do think the WSGA was provoked. I do think they had a legitimate problem with rustlers. But I do not think they were justified in doing what they did. At the end of the day, they set out to kill a whole lot of people over some missing cows. Had they been successful, I'm sure they would have killed a few rustlers. I'm also positive more good men, innocent men, would have been slaughtered. All so they could make a little bit of extra money. And that's about all I've got on the Johnson County War. But Frank Canton's story is far from over. No longer a welcome sight in northern Wyoming, he was in dire need of both a change of scenery and a new job. No worries though, his friends in the WSGA had him covered. Call it a separation bonus for a job well done. And say hello to Frank Canton, the brand new supervisor of the Nebraska City Meatpacking Company over in Nebraska City, just south of Omaha. A new opportunity, however, beckoned down Indian Territory way. So please join me next week as we discuss Frank Canton's ultimate fate. What do you think? Does he pay for his crimes in Texas? Go back to prison or clear his name once and for all? And how many bad guys will Canton apprehend while in Oklahoma? Will he ever make his way to Alaska? Are there vampires in Alaska? According to the movie 30 Days of Night, there are. And was Frank Cannon even a vampire? Or is that just more of my silly nonsense? Stick around and find out. Thanks as always for listening. Please head on over to wildwestextra.com to check out more true tales from the wild and woolly west. While you're there, hit that contact button and let me know what you think. And if you like what you hear, please spread the word and tell others about the Wild West extravaganza. Lots of good stuff coming in the future, so I really hope you stick around. Don't forget, you've only got 25 more days till Christmas. Or as Uncle Joey Diaz likes to say, 25 more shoplifting days. Better get them orders in now.
Till next time, try not to attack an entire county with an army of mercenaries and then act like you didn't do nothing wrong. Also, don't shoot yourself in the leg. Adios. Here comes the dadgum cavalry.